I will never be one to tell you what you should believe or what you should not believe. What I will say is that if you want to say that where we don't understand things, that's where God rests, that's where God operates, the God of the gaps argument, because I get asked that all the time. What was around before the universe? I don't know. Must have been something, God. So they got to stick in God where we're not there yet. And I just say, well, I got, we got top people working on that. That's, it's a current frontier. We're not there yet. And given the history of the moving frontier, where people had previously said, well, God must be operating, we're long past that. We, those explanations have come. And so I, I don't, there's no compelling reason to say God did it and then sort of give up and go on to the next problem. If you look at people who are religious today who are not in conflict with science, they have viewed their religious text as a spiritual, something that gives them spiritual support, not as a science textbook. The, the, inter, the, the conflict in society is when you have those who are still religious who want to use their religious text as their access point to understanding the natural world. And persistent efforts of the past to make that happen have just simply failed. The, the, the Bible does not work as a science textbook. In fact, Galileo knew this, and he himself was a religious man. He's famously quoted as saying, the Bible tells you how to go to heaven, not how the heavens go. <laughs> when you're a kid, your parents have all the answers, whether or not they do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they're right all the time, too. <laughs> and they're right all the time, they have all the answers. <laughs> and you are full of questions. Exactly. And then there comes a time when you realize your parents don't have all the answers to the questions that you've posed. Mm -hmm. Not only that, you reach a point where you've posed questions where nobody has the answer. And this is a, this is a point of intellectual maturity that is terrifying. How could we not know the answer? How is that possible? What? Mm -hmm. How? And if you look through the history of unknowns in our culture, that is a fundamental role religion has played. Religion of all stripes. You go back to ancient Greece, we call it mythology, but it's really their religion, all right? You know, Zeus and, and Neptune, not Neptune, uh, Poseidon. And so there's a storm. I don't know anything about storms. I don't know anything about the Coriolis force or the, the, or the, the ocean atmosphere connection or moisture and, and relative humidity. I don't know anything about any of that yet. Poseidon is angry. A lightning bolt hit. Zeus is angry. Those are my explanations, and I'm done. Now I don't have to live in some kind of profound state of ignorance about the world around me and its effect on my life. After death, I have no idea. Am I actually rotting in the ground? No, you are in some other place. You're on uh, Valhalla or heaven or whatever the religion provides for that belief system. You cannot become a scientist if you require that every question has an answer. Mm -hmm. Because it's the very questions that have no answers that attract you to the laboratory every single day. Mm -hmm. So there's got to be some kind of a shift. Part of it is you never really grew up from, as, from childhood because mm -hmm. you're always asking questions. <clears throat> but you've successfully made the transition to say, here's a question, not only did my parents not know, nobody doesn't know. And I will then set up an entire lab just to find that answer. And when you do find that answer, that is one of the greatest moments that can happen in a scientist's life. Do you give people who make this case that that was the beginning and that there had to be something that provoked the beginning, do you give them an A at least for trying to reconcile faith and reason? Um, I don't think they're reconcilable. What do you mean? Well, well, so let me say that differently. All efforts that have been invested by brilliant people of the past have failed at that exercise. They just fail. And so I don't, I, I don't, the track record is so poor that going forward I have essentially zero confidence, near zero confidence, that there will be fruitful things to emerge from the effort to reconcile it. So, for example, if you, if you knew nothing about science and you read, say, the Bible, the Old Testament, which in Genesis is an account of nature. That's, that's what that is. And I said to you, give me your description of the natural world based only on this. You would say the world was created in six days and that stars are just little points of light, much lesser than the sun. And in fact, they can fall out of the sky, right? Because that's what happens during, during the 
um, Revelation. One of the signs that yeah. the second coming is that the stars will fall out of the sky and land on earth. So to even write that means you don't know what those things are. You have no concept of what the actual universe is. So everybody who tried to make proclamations about the physical universe based on Bible passages got the wrong answer. <laughs> so what happened was when science discovers things and you want to stay religious or you want to continue to believe that the Bible is, is unerring, what you would do is you would say, well, let me go back to the Bible and reinterpret it. Then you'd say things like, oh, they didn't really mean that literally. They meant that figuratively. So this whole sort of reinterpretation of the fig how figurative the poetic passages of the Bible are came after science showed that this is not how things unfolded. And so the educated religious people are perfectly fine with that. It's the fundamentalists who want to say that the Bible is the literally, literal truth of God that, and want to see the Bible as a science textbook who are knocking on the science doors of the schools trying to put that content in the science. Uh, enlightened religious people are not behaving that way. They're saying, yes, yeah, science is cool, we're good with that, and use the Bible for, to get your spiritual enlightenment and your emotional fulfillment. Um, I read a book, Constellation of Philosophy. The main guy, Boethius, is condemned to death. He has everything taken from him. All he has is his reason and his sense of self. Not even that. But he attempts to console himself to this execution by reasoning that the world has order, that there is something that keeps things together. And he uses his reason to try and get to the root of why he should be at peace at death. The problem is, his source of origin is a belief in God. What would you do? Well, I, I don't know if I fully understand the question. I do know that uh, if he's about to be executed... Uh, How about you are about to be executed? Oh, I'm about to be executed. You have nothing except your knowledge and your, your knowledge of science, your experience. I would request that my body in death be buried, not cremated, so that the energy content contained within it gets returned to the earth so that flora and fauna can dine upon it just as I have dined upon flora and fauna throughout my life. And they're going to say, aha, those scientists have discovered God because God, dark matter, is what holds this universe together. So is that a question? <laughs> it's a statement. You know, you know they're going to so, say that. So the history of discovery, particularly cosmic discovery, but discovery in general, scientific discovery, is one where at any given moment there's a frontier. And there tends to be an urge for people, especially religious people, to assert that across that boundary into the unknown lies the handiwork of God. This shows up a lot. Newton even said it. He had his laws of gravity and motion, and he was explaining the moon and the planet. He was there. He doesn't mention God for any of that. And then he gets to the limits of what his equations can calculate. So I don't, can't quite figure this out. Maybe God steps in and makes it right every now and then. That's, that's where he invoked God. And, the, and Ptolemy, he, he, he bet on the wrong horse, but he was a brilliant guy. He formulated the geocentric universe with Earth in the middle. This is where we got epicycles and all these, right. all this, the machinations of the heavens. There was still a mystery to him. He, he looked up and uttered the following words. I, when I trace at my pleasure the windings to and fro of the heavenly bodies. These are the planets going through retrograde and back. The mysteries of the earth. When I trace at my pleasure the windings to and fro of the heavenly bodies, I no longer touch earth with my feet. I stand in the presence of Zeus himself and take my fill of ambrosia. What he did was invoke, he didn't invoke Zeus to account for the rock that he's standing on or the air he's breathing. It was this point of mystery and in gets invoked God. This, over time, has been described by philosophers as the God of the gaps. Mm -hmm. if, if that's how you, if that's where you're going to put your God in this world, then God is an ever-receding pocket of scientific ignorance. 
if that's how you're going to invoke God. If God is the mystery of the universe. These mysteries, we're, t- we're tackling these mysteries one by one. If you're going to stay religious at the end of the conversation, God has to be more to you than just where science has yet to tread. So to the person who says, maybe dark matter is God, if the only reason why you're saying it is because it's a mystery, then get ready to have that undone. Now, I've been brought into some of that conversation just to help people understand what science is and what science is not. And so I think what's unfortunate about how that's turned is uh, religion is becoming sort of the enemy of science, or science the enemy of religion, and that's only because religious forces are trying to put religious writings in the science classroom. Now, there's no tradition of the science professor knocking down the door of the Sunday school, telling the preacher to put science in what goes on in the Sunday school class. There's no tradition of that. There are no scientists picketing outside of churches saying, you know, equal time for Darwin. It doesn't happen. It's not how this country was founded. So it's this, it's this needless debate going on out there when people need to know if your belief system derives from what's called inspired truths that do not come out of empirical investigation of the physical world, it has no place in the science classroom. That doesn't mean it has no place anywhere else. Put it in the religious philosophy class. Put it in the history of human thought class. But it just has no place in the science classroom. And you're going to say, I can't solve this problem. Neither can anyone who will ever be born after me solve this problem. Therefore, it is intelligently designed. How dare you make that comment? Well, no, maybe it's true. But I don't want to put you in charge of the, like, Alzheimer's research or of the cancer prevention research. No, I'm going to put you somewhere else. Put you on the factory line or something. I'm going to get you out of that frontier lab because the discoveries are not coming from you. And so the issue in Dover should not have been kick ID out of the school system. No, it's, it's weird. People, people have do- invoked it. You don't sweep that under the rug. It's a fascinating part of the chapter of his- it, it history. So put it in the philosophy class. Put it in the religion class. Put it in the history of science class. But because science is a philosophy of discovery, it has no place in the science classroom. And that was my only argument. It simply doesn't belong in the science classroom because it's not science.